Hello and welcome to the Cytokine Signaling Forum author interview podcast. My name is Professor Peter Nash and today I'm talking to Professor Bernard Coombe from the University of Montpellier in France about a letter that looks at the efficacy and safety data based on historical or pre-existing conditions at baseline for patients with active RA who were treated with baricitinib. Welcome Bernard, thank you so much for giving up some of your time to discuss this letter with us. So first of all, can I ask you what was the main objective of doing this analysis? Uh, nice to hear you Peter and uh, as uh, you understood, uh, the main objective of this uh, postdoc analysis of uh, randomized control trial with baricitinib was to investigate if um, comorbidities, uh, high prevalence of comorbidities could change the efficacy and safety of baricitinib 4 mg per day versus a placebo. Excellent. And how did you design the, the analysis? What studies did you look at? In, which ones did you include? So we, we mainly uh, look at uh, five baricitinib studies that were pulled only for baricitinib 4 mg per day uh, because we had to a few, only a few patients that received 2 mg per day so they were excluded from uh, this analysis. And in addition to that we also uh, took in consideration the long-term extension studies with baricitinib whatever was the dosage and uh, but mainly for the safety uh, analysis. Excellent and can you tell us a little bit about why you chose depression and osteoporosis and the things that you chose? So we selected uh, some comorbidities. First of all the more frequent comorbidities is that are um, usually uh, seen in RA patients that mean uh, cardiovascular disease and um, pulmonary, pulmonary disorder that are the, probably the most important uh, comorbidities in RA and who uh, drive uh, the life expectancies of this patient. In addition to that we consider depression and osteoporosis who, which are also uh, classical comorbidities in RA that are, they are increased in RA patients versus the general population and in uh, our um, patient population who have significant uh, number of patients uh, who have this kind of comorbidities because to to analyze this, uh, correctly the effect of the drugs uh, uh, in, 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 in patients with or without comorbidities we need to add uh, uh, a uh, significant um, a number of patients who had these comorbidities. It was the same for hepatic disorder. Hepatic disorder is not a usual comorbidities in RA but many patients have uh, liver disease and um, and as you know baricitinib like uh, genic jack inhibitors in general may have some uh, safety concern regarding liver so this was also uh, analyzed. Did, did you mean that they have abnormal liver function or they had established liver disease because Many studies don't let patients in if they have significant comorbidities. They tend to put well people into clinical trials. No, they, they, they don't have uh, so they have history of liver disease sometimes, but not a severe uh, liver disease. Otherwise, they were excluded from the randomized control trials, as you know. And this is a limitation uh, of this kind of study because. Uh, in randomized control trial, most of the patients do not have any uh, severe comorbidities. Uh, but anyway, they had some um, um, lab test anomalities, but some weak uh, uh, abnormalities. Otherwise, once again, they have been excluded from the, from the study. It was interesting that um, baricitinib is 70% renally excreted, but was there an attempt to look at renal disease in this patient population as a comorbidity? So we didn't consider renal disease uh, because uh, most of uh, it is once again it's not a usual comorbidity in RA patients and secondly 
uh, at baseline, um, most of the patients are no more renal function. Excellent. So why don't you tell us a bit about the results, what you found? So we, we first uh, look at the efficacy data at 12 weeks. Points is most of the randomized control trial, and secondly, we look at uh, at the safety uh, in in patient with or without comorbidities, and we took uh, uh, separately each of the five comorbidities. Um, uh, first, uh, depression, osteoporosis, hepatic disorder then cardiovascular disease and pulmonary disorder. Overall, there was no difference uh, between uh, a patient with or without the comorbidities uh, regarding ACR20 response at 12 weeks, ACR50-28 low disease activity or change in act, uh, uh, disability index. Um, and when we look at uh, each um, comorbidities uh, separately, there was also no real uh, difference. Uh, what we can note anyway is that patients uh, with depression uh, have a lower uh, response, uh, a lower response than patients without depression. There was no uh, statistical difference, but it was uh, numerically uh, lower, and uh, the, ACR, uh, the, the rate of ACR responders, for example, was lower. For example, for ACR20, it was 59.4% in for baricitinib in patient with depression versus 68% in patient without uh, depression. And any hypothesis for that? Do you think it's because the patient reported outcomes affected the ACR response, or was it even down to the level of swollen joints? And no, uh, you know that in patients with depression, we have uh, several factors that may influence um, the therapeutic response. And more or less, in the different studies that have been shown previously, that patient with depression at, at a, a lower response than uh, than patient without depression. So it's not. I don't think it's uh, it's specific for the paracetinib studies, but it's a general rule for a patient with RA and depression. And you mentioned before one limitation. Are there other limitations we should be aware of with this study? But first of all, it's a post-hoc analysis, so it's always a limitation because the study at the beginning was not designed to look at uh, this objective. Uh, the second limitation that I have uh, talked about is that in randomized control trial, we have um, usually less patients with severe comorbidities than in real life. And it's clear that looking at real life patients would be interesting, but look, uh, it's more difficult to 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 carefully uh, look at uh, at efficacy data in real life. Um, so I think it's, uh, this is this are the major uh, limitations that we should uh, consider. Excellent, and I I just think uh, uh, are there any also, because, uh, we have also we have also to careful because we didn't have too many patients in each group. So uh, even we have at the, in total more than five, uh, 1,500 patients uh, in each comorbidity group, there was uh, between 100 and 300 patients only. You also didn't have a lot of people over 75. Any comment on the effect of age on your results? Yes, you, you, you're right. Um, elderly patients were not uh, uh, really represented in, in these studies and in all the randomized control trials that have been uh, published, published for the phase three development. Uh, and these patients are usually uh, comorbidities. It's probably one of the reasons why they were excluded. And an interesting group because it's recommended we only use two milligrams in that group rather than four milligrams. So exactly, and um, and in in 
as you know, we didn't uh, look at the two milligram uh, efficacy data due to the low number of patients that were receiving this dosage in uh, the randomized control trials. Thank you. And um, what lessons should uh, the clinician take away from this? We should pay more attention to comorbidities, particularly depression, which is one of those things we tend not to look into with our patients. Uh, I, I think it's not, now um, you know perfectly, Peter, that uh, comorbidity is a major issue now in our management, and um, we should always look uh, in each patient uh, with RA at the comorbidity profile that may uh, influence um, influence the outcome of these patients. Uh, until now, there is no demonstration that uh, comorbidity may uh, change the therapeutic response. And this study, that is the first with the Jack inhibitor looking at, uh, at this question, confirm that patients with comorbidity have the same chance of uh, being responders that patients without comorbidity. So they should be treated like this, uh, like the patient uh, without comorbidity. But we should also consider in this trial that we didn't have different safety profile between the two groups, patient with or without comorbidity. That is very important because usually we consider that patients with comorbidities are more at risk of having side effect, like for example, infection, severe infection, uh, compared to patient without comorbidity. In this uh, randomized control trial, we selected patients, selected patients that we should be cautious. Uh, we didn't see any uh, safety difference uh, between the, the different groups. So the take home message for the clinician, the lessons to learn, to summarize and finish, what do you think we should recommend to our doctor, our rheumatology colleagues? Uh, the first point is that uh, we should always look at the different comorbidities, including uh, depression that is clearly uh, frequent in our patients. The second point that we should treat uh, the patient uh, with comorbidities similarly that our patient without comorbidities, even we should be careful regarding uh, the safety. So that's a level of reassurance, both from an efficacy and a safety point of view. Of course, we always need more patients treated for longer. Uh, ACR last year, they showed, I think, six-year Barry data follow-up. How long do we need safety follow-up with these new medications, do you think? Do we need 10 years? Do we need 20 years? If no new signals are popping up. Uh, you know, the exposure, the, the duration of exposure is always very important. Uh, for the safety, I don't think, for the infection, which is a major issue with all the targeted therapy in RA, I don't think that we need such a long time. Uh, when we have um, five years data, it's already very good. For malignancy, it's different. Malignancy, we need always to have a long-term uh, follow-up. And uh, there is no signal currently with uh, most of the drugs that we are using, including jack inhibitors. Uh, but in this respect, 10 years could be probably uh, the best. Thank you so much. Um, I thank you again for your time. I know you're in the middle of a busy clinic. Uh, this has been the uh, Cytokine Signaling Forum April Author Podcast. If you'd like to know more about this paper and the recommendation that we should consider comorbidities in our patients but not let them stop us prescribing appropriately for our patients and perhaps we need a few more Bex depression inventories amongst our patients because they won't tell us unless we ask. Uh, you can find this paper and others uploaded to the CSF website this month. There are detailed slide sets are available in the publication section at cytokinesignaling.com. Please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or other podcast media and let us know what you think. Thank you so much, Bernard. Thank you, Peter.